Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see everyone in person and not on Zoom. You're all really 3D. It's exciting. And you're all much taller or shorter than I thought you would be. Um, this is what I'm learning as I'm bad at predicting that. <laughs> Very excited to be here today with these, with these panelists. Uh, I think we'll have uh, a very interesting conversation. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Clark Flintbar. I'm a senior policy advisor here with Chain Uh And I'm going to kick things off by asking folks to, to introduce themselves, starting with you, David. Okay. Thanks, Clark. It's great to be here. My name is David Puth, and I am the CEO of Center. And Center is the organization that was created in 2018 by Coinbase and Circle to develop standards for the issuance of fiat-backed stablecoins, the first being USDC, which is issued by, uh, by Circle. And the goal, the long-term goal, is for us to develop a trusted global network of interoperable stablecoins. Uh, my history is in traditional finance. I've been involved in the blockchain ecosystem for about three years now. Great. Thank you. Candice? Hi, I'm Candace Kelly, and I am the Chief Legal Officer for the Stellar Development Foundation. So we're a nonprofit organization that supports the growth and development of the Stellar Network, which I'm sure you'll learn more about if you're not familiar with the Stellar Network today. Um, and it's one of the networks that has USDC issued on it. Uh, and our mission is creating equitable access to the global financial system. So the way that the network was designed and the Stellar Consensus Protocol was designed, uh, it really was had stable coins and asset-backed uh, digital tokens in mind and cross-border payments as the, what it's optimized for. So being able to, to send tokens uh, across borders quickly, securely, and uh, for very low or almost, almost, I'm the lawyer, so I'll never say no, but almost no fees. Uh, so anyway, really excited to be here. Oh, and my background is uh, I was a federal prosecutor for 17 years. Uh, spent, uh, well, I spent that many years at Department of Justice, mostly as a prosecutor. There, I had stints working in the Attorney General's office at Maine Justice, uh, the Deputy Attorney General's office, and I was special counsel for national security for Bob Mueller when he was director of the FBI. He happened to be the U.S. attorney who hired me in San Francisco, so... Um, there's some there's some themes there, but uh, anyway, and then um, and now I'm here in blockchain space. And you also went to Williams College, which is my alma mater. So oh, I'm yes, very excited yes. to have you here today, <laughs> and you as well, Paul. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Paul Bansis. Um, I am the head of market and business development for PayPal's uh, new cryptocurrency business unit, uh, BCDC. Not very original, but it stands for Blockchain Cryptocurrency and Digital Currency. Um, I think you're hopefully all familiar with PayPal and or Venmo. Uh, we've been obviously, you know, at the forefront of digital payments now for over two decades, uh, providing, you know, tools uh, necessary for folks to be able to, you know, make payments, uh, both domestic and cross-border and uh, e-commerce and both online now and offline. Uh, and obviously we've been trying to, you know, continue to innovate, you know, responsibly by providing those tools. Uh, and as you may be familiar, uh, it was now back in 2020 that we first jumped into the cryptocurrency space, both on the PayPal side and on Venmo. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, everyone. Um, so I think one of the interesting things in crypto is that everyone, uh, as Candace was alluding to, has a, a long history elsewhere. Um, so I'm interested how you guys came into crypto and how you found yourself in the digital asset space. Maybe we'll start with, with Paul and work our way back. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I didn't give my background, actually. I, I was also an attorney for many years and had a midlife crisis and decided to reinvent myself. Uh, but I think, like most people, uh, the first exposure was just when in the world is Bitcoin on a more personal basis, and you kind of go down that rabbit hole. Uh, and started just being interested more in the underlying technology that I was involved in. At the time, I did work for a global remittance company, uh, so I was fascinated by, you know, just how exactly we could leverage this sort of technology for not only from the consumer aspect of cross-border um, uh, cross remittances, but also just on the back end in terms of the settlement. As you can imagine, when you have a global remittance company, there is, uh, you know, a lot of money movement both within the organization and with your agents. Uh, so that's where I started, uh, you know, looking at that in greater uh, detail. And then back in 2019, uh, it went back to PayPal. I had been there originally uh, working in the emerging markets in Latin America and took a five-year break. 
went back to um, help put together the cryptocurrency strategy of the company uh, and then executing on that, uh, you know, going forward. So that was sort of my introduction first as just an interest in it. And then, you know, things worked out to now being my, my full time gig. Awesome. Kenda? Uh, my my story is a little different. So I was, as I said, I went straight from law school to the Department of Justice. And uh, at the end of those years, I was the chief of the Special Prosecutions and National Security Unit in the, in the Northern District of California. And part of my job was not just to catch the bad guys and try cases and, and um, do that, but also to go out and do outreach with the folks in Silicon Valley alongside my colleagues at the FBI. Uh, and particularly in the, in the cyber, national security cyberspace. And what I was finding was there was just this huge divide, trust and knowledge gap. And I thought, you know, these people don't understand. Like, they, they don't trust the government. They don't understand. And then I stepped back and thought, well, I've only ever worked in the government myself. So if we're going to make those bridges and we're going to move forward, um, we need to have people who've worked on both, both in public and private. And one of the – I did – I left government to, to, with that in, intent. I went to Uber um, with that intent, having been a federal prosecutor. Soon after I got there, I found myself running a lot of um, internal investigations and investigations, so it didn't, that was not why I went there. <laughs> so uh, blockchain was another space uh, that I saw a similar knowledge and trust gap between government and, and the private sector. And so it was very important to me when I took on this role that I'm, I don't have just legal under me. I have legal and policy. So I spent a lot of time on the regulatory side and trying to work with um, regulators in uh, crafting smart and well-informed regulations, uh, which again, I'm sure we'll end up talking about more of that, but, um, but that, was my, that was my path. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, I started my career in uh, traditional finance, so in markets businesses, and spent uh, the bulk, uh, nearly three quarters of my career was spent running trading and sales businesses. And, what I was able to see in the evolution of those businesses was the extraordinary amount of efficiency that was created through technology and how it changed uh, the shape of the market and the ability for people to transact in a more seamless way. Uh, I went on to run a highly regulated uh, payments and settlements company that, uh, and when I say highly regulated, I mean as pretty far on the right-hand side as you could get. Uh, it's known as a systemically important financial market utility and understood through that the, the importance of having systems that simply can't go down. And it was a very logical step to begin to look at new technologies that could, could perhaps create even greater efficiency, particularly in the world of payments, uh, and as well bring standards and practices to the blockchain industry that we felt could help organizations and individuals gain greater trust in the ecosystem. And that is at the heart of what it is that we try to do at Center. That's great. Thank you. These are all such, such interesting backstories. Um, I feel like something that we've heard a lot thus far in the conference is discussion of innovation. So I wanted to ask you each, what is your company doing to promote innovation in, in digital finance? And how do you view that? Who wants to go first? I'm happy to start since, you know, you guys have started one each. Um, so as a, as a foundation that supports the ecosystem, uh, we get the opportunity to interact with tons of projects that are building on the Stellar Network, and it's really exciting. Um, and so we see everything from, you know, tokenized securities to uh, projects that are helping refugees uh, in Africa who are crossing borders and need to have control over their, over their value and need to be able to, once they get to wherever they may end up landing, um, be able to have that value be worth something and be usable. And so a lot of what we focus on is the, the interoperability between the traditional system and the digital world. And so because we're so focused on financial inclusion, if you're unbanked right now, I don't know how if anyone in this room is unbanked, but if anyone in this room has purchased cryptocurrency, did you use your bank account in an ACH transfer or one of the few credit cards? Probably, right? So um, there's some really exciting innovations that are happening to give, to really reach the unbanked and to create on and off ramps through um, 
uh, we have a partnership right now that's it's in it's in development and it's in testing, but it's it's public and li and going to be live soon with MoneyGram. So if you can imagine the number of MoneyGram agents across the globe who are very well versed in having people walk in with their cash, doing KYC and all their compliance checks. Now, if they come in with their cash and they want to have USDC issued by Circle in a wallet, those agents, in addition to their normal checks, they now can can trace the wallet that that the consumer wants to send it to. But this is an unbanked person who's able to get into the digital space. And then they can do what they want, right? They can send their remittance, not using the MoneyGram rails. Um, they, can, um, they can go buy an NFT. They can do whatever they want. So a lot of our use cases that we focus on in the, the partnerships that, and the projects that we support are doing innovative things like that and really trying to connect. Uh, we don't, we're not interested in supplanting the traditional system, we want to enhance it and, and interoperate with it. If I could take over from there, just because it, it dovetails so well with what it is that we're trying to uh, accomplish at Sender. And uh, we are partners with Stellar in, in a number of different ways. And so our role in this, we're not a pure technology company, although we have technology people who are working on designing technical standards. But we are trying to build those standards and protocols and governance models that will enable exactly what Candace described to be able to be enacted with a level of trust so that more and more participants can step into the system. And so it started with trust in the stablecoin ecosystem. If one imagines, and I'll probably repeat this, using stablecoins, uh, developing this global network of stablecoins, if it's trusted by participants, we change the entire landscape for payments. It means that money can move at the speed of the internet at very little cost in, into everyone's wallet across borders. And it's exactly what Stellar is trying to do. It's a, I, I, PayPal is involved with doing a number of these things as well. So if we can create the standards and protocols that can help support that and work with issuers in beyond USDC, beyond Circle and USDC, to be able to apply these same standards to create this interoperable network, that at the end of the day is true financial inclusion. Just to mention, the uh, aforementioned uh, global remittance company I work for happened to be MoneyGrams, purely by coincidence. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've been doing this now for 20 years, right? And, and we uh, feel that we are uniquely situated. As most of you know, we have this uh, double-sided network that we have, right? We have 400 million consumers and, and merchants in, in over 200 countries, and we kind of sit in the middle of that. Um, so throughout the years, we've always been providing these, these tools to simply say we want to make the ability to make and receive a payment as simple as possible. We want to do that in a way that it's affordable, a way that is efficient, um, and in a way that is secure. Um, and then the natural evolution as we looked into the ecosystem of what was going on was to start looking at some of these. And, and basically what we want to do is be able to look at both sides of the transaction. We, we tend to stay away from the word just payment because for us, the payment or the exchange of value is a portion of that transaction. A transaction involves much more than just the exchange of value. But we want to be able to sit in the middle of that and look to the consumer or the buyer, the one that wants to make the payment, and say, we want to give you optionality and choice, whatever that may be, whether it's traditional funding instruments, whether it's digital currencies, we're going to support that. And then on the other side, to be able to say, whatever it is that you want to uh, you know, offer and be able to receive that, we want to be able to do that in a way um, that, again, fits the, the overall offering that we have is to do it in a way and in, a, in, a, in an environment that people are accustomed to. I'm sure if I take a survey here, probably all of you have at some point in time used PayPal or used Venmo for something. Um, so you're very familiar with that. And our goal is to integrate all of these new technologies and integrate these capabilities within that trusted environment. Um, and that's what we're pursuing uh, in this particular case because we do recognize that for a lot of folks, and maybe we kind of take it for granted all of us that work in this space is, is, and we're surrounded by people who are unbelievably talented, uh, you know, average person maybe may not know much about cryptocurrency. I'm sure, you know, friends and family are always asking you questions. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing it and we're, and we're providing this access in a way um, that sort of abstracts away some of the complexities that are involved, but at the same time, um, giving folks that access, the ability to explore and in sort of that trusted environment. So that's sort of our goal going forward with this. That's great. If I can just jump in on that, I, I just want to echo what you that last point, which is there are so many, we care a lot about making sure that 
those of us who really, and I don't know if I can even put myself in this category, who really understand the technology, don't fall in love with the technology so much that we forget the users, right? User experience and av actually having access, having someone who doesn't have a bank account feel comfortable and understand how using blockchain technology, whether they even know that's what it is. I mean, if you think about computers and, and how often I remember thinking like, oh, it's got Intel inside. I don't know what that means, but I trust it, right? I know that people who do know have, have um, set that as a standard. And so I think that that's a really important um, part of, of certainly financial inclusion and, and really pushing to more of a mainstream adoption is people making sure that they understand like keys are really hard, right? Let's think of better ways to make sure that people don't, they have options in terms of how they wanna store their keys and possibly have key recovery without giving up control, um, which is something that we, we've worked on um, and have a, have a self-hosted wallet as a subsidiary that, that's worked on that. So anyway, I, one, of my, one of my favorite topics I had to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, this is all very interesting. It's very exciting to see all of this, this happening in this space. Um, on a s slightly less positive note, uh, what are the challenges that you guys are seeing in the in the crypto space, and how are your your companies confronting those? I'll I'll kick off, but I, I I'd say the greatest challenge that that I have observed uh, since coming in into this world is the fact that we are still so new and we're still learning every day about where there are strengths and weaknesses in the system. And some of those were exposed very clearly over the course of the last several weeks. And it again brings me back to what it is that we're trying to do at center, and that is identify where those soft spots may be and address them through the development standards, through the development of technology, to partnering with people to be able to uh, help close those gaps. We're all aware that even the most sophisticated of, of chains today can only process a fraction of the t number of transactions that, it, that are done in the traditional payment system every single day. And we have a long way to go to be able to get to a point where the, both the technology and, and the protocols can interact in such a way to be able to really have this, have broad-based application beyond the applications that we're, that we're seeing today, which are, you know, really exciting and really fascinating, but they focus mostly on on crypto and you know, a lot on the growth of DeFi and some on the growth of NFTs. But if we, and we all, I think, feel that we do want to mainstream this technology, it's going to need to come with a lot of focus on what that will take. And I'll just close with having spent an extended period in the heavily regulated world and the expectation that particularly stable coins will find their way into the regulated world, more regulated world, some uh, fairly soon, this is a really critical element to be able to, to mainstream what's happening. And it will be, it'll be incredibly exciting, but it won't come, it won't come easily. Yeah, I, I have to echo that it's how new everything is. And I just spoke a little bit about on the consumer side and the user side and communicating to that and educating and informing them. But even, you know, when you're an incumbent like we are that, you know, we've had an existing business now for several decades, even being an evangelist for this to internal and external stakeholders, you know, a big part of my job is that, especially when we were starting out and we were a very small group within this very large organization, um, you know, you go into rooms and you start talking about all these things that you want to do with Bitcoin and ETH, et cetera you have to take the time to educate the folks, right? And not assume that people understand. And then, you know, there's a desire certainly to learn, but also, you know, there's responsibilities there of, well, they've built out programs, et cetera. And how do I weave in then this new concept into the existing framework of what, what we're doing? And that um, is a challenge, uh, but I think it's, it's very encouraged because, you know, certainly from the time that I started back in PayPal in 2019 till, till now, you know, that's been exponential growth in terms of just the, the desire to learn. And I remember, uh, you know, working from home during the pandemic and you have sort of Bloomberg in the background that maybe there was a crypto story once an hour and now it's every three minutes, you know, and, and just uh, the ubiquity of just the conversation. Um, but I think that's, that's, that's part of the challenge is, is again, internal and external uh, stakeholders to really give them that information because it's difficult if you're just going by the sound bites or sort of the, you know, the Twitter things that come out 
uh, although Twitter is a fascinating place to learn about cryptocurrency, but uh, at the same time, it's just you know walking them through and, and, and making sure that they have access to this information in an unbiased way um, so that they can evaluate and learn. And I found that the more that you do that, uh, obviously it helps not only you know, from the organization and the things you want to accomplish, but overall in the ecosystem, whether it's conversations with, as I said, internally, but regulators and other uh, other partners that you may be operating with and that's that's part of our job is to make sure that we're communicating that uh, you know to all of those parties yeah I would say that it's uh, I think summarizing both of those it's it's the reason that I left the government knowledge and trust um, closing that knowledge and trust gap and it is at all levels right it's it's from other you know companies that are interested in building on the network it's with regulators it's with policymakers it's uh, with you know I've had I had a lot of conversations with MGI um, as we as we built this um, this partnership and it's been really amazing I, I remember just recently uh, listening to the GC talking to someone else in a, on a zoom call and I was like wow this is like night and day from the first conversation I had. And it's really not been that long, right? It is moving quickly and people are learning. But I think the, the knowledge and the trust gap is in part, um, you know, your question of how did we all come to crypto, I think that is really important when you're talking to, whoever you're talking to is understanding, right? If your first introduction to cryptocurrency was terrorists who were using it for really bad things. It took me a really long time to get comfortable and really understand and talk to our founder and talk to everyone to really understand what it is and how it can be used and how it can be used safely. And I leverage that process when I'm talking to policymakers and regulators because a lot of them, ransomware is the use case that they know about. And I say, well, let me tell you about some use cases for people in your own district who are trying to send money home to Mexico and they can do it this way and, you know, the traditional way, and it's going to take a long time, and they don't know when the money's going to get there. They're going to have a terrible fees and trans uh, forex. And then there's this other option that is growing and building on, um, on blockchain technology. So I think it's all encompassed with that. And, and all of that, of course, when in the regulator and policymaker space is on a path towards regulatory clarity because I think that is – from my vantage point, um, the crux of of the um, the challenge, right, is that we need to have more clarity because too many projects are they're trying to move quickly, but they can't because they don't know exactly what the rules are. Um, so you can be a well-intentioned actor and all of a sudden be talking to a regulator who you didn't mean to offend, but they never told you what you were supposed to do and not do. So I think regulatory clarity would be the other challenge I would highlight. Absolutely, I think that's that's very important. Um, changing gears a little bit, uh, and David, you brought this up, but I'm I'm interested in in your thoughts on Terra and its recent depegging and plummet, and and what you think will be the the regulatory and policy response to that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's you know we're we're all acutely aware of what's gone on in the market over the last couple of weeks, frankly, over the last several months, and I think. Uh, the breakdown in Terra was emblematic of exactly what we talked about. Uh, what, what we talked about just before is that this is still a very new system with very new technology and very new sets of uh, rules around how things get built and get executed. And at Sender, we try to be very open about supporting projects in in every corner of uh, of the crypto ecosystem that are being done properly, legitimately, to try to achieve that broader mission that we've all highlighted of giving people more control over their financial situation. Uh, the, the, the Terra breakdown, as, as much as we're supportive of other models, we think what we've done in, with USDC is, is it's an entirely different way of building a stablecoin. And there's a, there's a fundamental difference between what goes on in the algorithmic world and what goes on in the fiat pack world. And we've locked into an idea that we think is is safe and sound and very transparent and one that regulators uh, are intensely focused on for all the right reasons, the rapid growth of what happened in stable coins over the last year and then uh, what happened over the last several weeks. So I think there's absolutely no question that we will anticipate that regulation, whatever regulation was in the works and you all probably had some familiarity with the president's working group 
uh, or any of the other number of regulators that has come out with fairly clear guidance on what they think should happen here and whether stable coins should be uh, part of an insured depository institution or stable coins could be issued, continue to be issued with state money transmission licenses. Whatever happened in the last week just accelerated that focus. You heard Janet Yellen talk very openly about the fact that this needs to happen. You've heard uh, controller of the currency, Michael Sue, talk about the need for standards for stable coins. And so all of this is why we're so focused on being able to create what we hope will be responsible regulation, particularly given the ex exceptional lead the United States has in this space today. So responsible regulation that will support innovation over the longer term. And I said it earlier, what we're trying to do is ensure that, that one, there's responsible regulation through well-informed regulators, but also that the standards that we build are in addition to the regulations that will be created and not in any way a replacement for those. Yeah, this Paul. Yeah, so um, so we've spent a lot of time talking about stable coins as because USDC and we always like to say the Stellar Network was built for digital backed tokenization. That was as I started this conversation. Um, that was really it, it was there was no word called stable coin. I actually remember when I first joined having looking at a contract and saying, well, what should we call it? Should we call it fiat backed assets? Should we call it a tether? Should we call it a this that? We had this whole all. 20 of us in the company um, conversation about it. And I think that that's one of the key things that I've, it's kind of coming full, full circle with the Terra situation, which is there should be a very clearly defined standard for what is a stable coin. And it should be transparent. I think circle is like the model of how you do that. But there also has to be room for innovation. And so you can have an algorithmic coin, but I wouldn't call it a stable coin. And you can have something that may not have the same level of reserves. Um, certainly when small fintechs are trying to do this in other countries, issuing on the Stellar Network, on day one, it's really hard to put that line item in to say, we're going to have you know, PwC or EY or whoever do an outside audit to, to be able to have these attestations. But that does not excuse a company from just general consumer protection and transparency. So I think that as long as there is transparency, and, as, and I am a big advocate of pushing that, I've seen, I think, 18 different bills that I've commented on many, and um, you know, our CEO testified before House Financial Services in December, right after the PWG, the President's Working Group report came out. So there's a lot, and yes, it's accelerating. Um, the calls are coming faster and more furiously, and so I'm very, I'm very hopeful that we will break down the, the aisles and, uh, in Congress and, and get to something that's smart and, uh, and helpful for the, for the consumer, for regulators and law enforcement, and for the industry so people know what it is. Like, we shouldn't be shutting down innovation, but we should be clear about what different innovations are. Yeah, you know, my, my first comment is, obviously, it's heartbreaking to, to see what happens, especially when, you know, work at a company where protecting customers and doing the right thing is, is part of your, your, your DNA. And, and, you know, if you try to find a silver lining here, I think the only thing to say is there was so, so much great momentum up to this about these discussions on stable coins, great debate and, you know, president's working group. And we were really analyzing that. And I'm, I'm hoping if anything positive comes out here is um, that we continue with that momentum. And to your point, Words matter, and I love that that phrase, right? Because we have to recognize that we have a tendency in this space, in this ecosystem, to, you know, lump all cryptocurrencies together, all protocols together, all stable coins together, um, and that I think we need to move away from that and, and start recognizing some of the differences here and understanding what are the risks that are posed by by each, and and how do you regulate that? But I think if, uh, what I'm hoping doesn't occur is I, I think we were with that momentum. There was a recognition that you know stable coins will will play a vital role in this ecosystem, right? I think we're all getting to that point and, and accepting that, um, and I'm hoping something like this doesn't derail that, um, and that we continue to have meaningful dialogue uh, with that because what comes out on the other side is what my colleagues here uh, just mentioned is is you know thoughtful regulation and and you know responsible innovation by by the participants that are going to provide value through those stable coins. Yeah, I, I do need to add one last point that, that is now um, 
it's something that I think we're, we're all focused on is just the amount of innovation that's gone on in our space has been extraordinary. And there is no one who can successfully pick what the winning model will be. And we, we can look at all kinds of analogies from the automobile to the internet uh, IPO boom. And uh, there are 18,000 tokens out there today. One thing we can be very sure of is if there are 18,000 tokens in five years, they won't be the same 18,000 tokens. And we need to be sure that as an industry that we are supporting, sufficiently supporting innovation, both on the regulatory front, but also in the industry side, that will enable different models to emerge that maybe we've just simply never conceived of today that could be enormously helpful to the industry in the future. And, and that's part of why we try to keep a really open mind we're betting on one thing right now and hopefully a couple more of those in the not too distant future. But the idea is we don't feel like we've got a lock on what the end game, what the end state is. There's, there's going to be a number of different things that are going to emerge that will, that we can't even conceive of today that will be very exciting in the future. Thank you. Um, a topic that, that often comes up uh, in line with, with stable coins or alongside stable coins is central backed digital, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. And the recent executive order on digital assets from the Biden administration called for an examination of the potential for a US dollar denominated uh, CBDC. I'm wondering um, what you think about that. Is the US ready for that? And what should policymakers be thinking about? Um, as they they explore that potential. I'll, I'll defend. Uh, you know, certainly, we should be evaluating that. It's uh, almost every central bank that I know of is evaluating this, and I, I have the great pleasure of sitting on the engagement forum in the UK for Her Majesty's Treasury and the Bank of England, and spending the time um, to first, as things forgot to mention, it don't fall in love with the technology. First, it's what are you trying to solve? What are the pain points here? And identifying those use cases. And a lot of time on that engagement forum is spent on that. Um, you know, whether we're ready for it or not, it's yet to, to be determined. But I think you have to have those conversations and have to analyze to see, again, what is your motivation? And, and each country will be different. Are you trying to solve a financial inclusion issue? Are you just looking for efficiency? Um, is there other motivation for it? Uh, but, but, you know, from a PayPal perspective, why we're so interested and we try to speak to many of the central banks and, again, the participation in a couple of these forums is, uh, you know, despite this being a central bank digital currency, I think the interaction between the CBDC and the private sector is going to be very important, right? Um, and, and for us, we want to stay, uh, you know, very close to that, to that dialogue and also sort of share our learnings, you know, because a, a lot of these, you know, we when you start looking at things like what you can do on PayPal with a PayPal balance and things to that extent, of sort of a digital representation of money that's being moved around, et cetera, um, I think those dialogues are, are helpful. It'll be interesting to see. I know there's a handful that are already out in the market in certain countries, and it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, but I think it's, it's encouraging, um, you know, for, for central banks that central banks are looking at this. In terms of what should they be looking at in policy, you know, the one that always sticks out to me is, is the privacy concerns that come up, you know, and, and, and the more I dig into that, the more I find that interesting. And I think, uh, you know, that, that'll be an interesting area of, of how the central banks go, go about, you know, addressing those issues. Because more and more, not only in payments, but overall, the concept of privacy and in my information in the last couple of years has been top of mind, uh, you know, in several industries. And, and I think it's, it's in the best interest to address those issues early on. And also, when you're making decisions about sort of the design and sort of the, the technology used for a CBDC, which may or may not be blockchain, um, is to make sure you don't inadvertently uh, lead to more financial exclusion, right? And those type of considerations have to go in when you're, when you're analyzing this. Um, but yeah, no, hi highly encouraged, I think, by, by what we're seeing in those dialogues that are going on. Yeah, I agree. It's so boring. We're all agreeing with each other. I disagree. Um, yeah, so we, um, I can talk a little bit, since I agree with all of those policy points. I do, in terms of the U.S., I think that the U.S. is always going to be more careful and slower than the Bahamas or Nigeria. They're different, they're different considerations that they're tr and challenges that they're trying to solve for. Uh, one area that I think the U.S. needs to be a little bit more aggressive on, on the global scale, is interoperability. Because if 
the 90 different countries that are currently looking at or have already issued CBDCs all build them in their own separate, in, in a way that's not interoperable, then we're going to recreate the same challenges we have in terms of the cross-border and, and intermediaries and things like that. So I think that's one, like in talking about standards, um, that that's an area that the, the U.S. could be very um, bullish on in terms of talking about that. And even if we're not quite ready um, to, to make a decision, much less build uh, a uh, CBDC here, I will also say that we have been working um, for, for quite a while now with the National Bank of Ukraine and the, Mid, the uh, Ministry of Digital Transformation there uh, long before the, the crisis that's happening there right now. And that work is still ongoing. And it's become more and more urgent and, and sort of become more real of how important if you had uh, an e havernia if you think about all of the cryptocurrency that has flooded into Ukraine and the USDC and all different denominations, if that could quickly be interoperable with a central bank-issued e havernia because one of the things that we were very mindful of when this first started and all this crypto was flooding into Ukraine because of our relationships with the National Bank and with the um, MDT was we don't want to do anything that's going to destabilize the Hibernia, you have enough challenges right now um, as it is. And so uh, continuing on that project of uh, an e-Hibernia there, I think was, it just added a new layer of, of this interoperability discussion that we always have, but it makes it much more tangible and real when you think about it with respect to the folks um, who are struggling over there in Ukraine. And, and one quick comment, because you mentioned the Bahamas, they win the award for the best name for any yes. CBDC. They called it the sand dollar. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we can up our game if there's ever one here in the U.S. But, yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Sorry. So I, I'm going to take a slightly different path on this, um, but highlight a couple of points that were made here. One, one is uh, I think it is largely impractical for the United States to consider the introduction of a central bank digital currency at anything that would resemble broad-based adoption for a very, very long time. Uh, and I, as Candace highlighted, the U.S. authorities are likely to be slow. And part of the reason they want to be, they're, they're going to be slow, policymakers in general in the Western world would prefer to see competent, well-run private sector solutions to help solve problems and observe those to see where people can go and, and what are the challenges and does this get the kind of take up which, again, is, I think, why you're seeing the amount of attention to stablecoin regulation that we are seeing today. So I, I think there are specific use cases that are attractive, that uh, primarily on a wholesale level that, and, and in certain economies. Interesting stats in, in Sweden, less than 15 percent of the money that changes hands is done so in any form of cash. In Mexico, that number is 85 percent. So there's a there's vastly different applications around the world depending on the on the culture and the geography and where the maturity of the of the system is. Uh, the other thing is, and this was uh, highlighted about uh, about privacy. And there is one central bank digital currency out there that was created solely for the ability to be able to dive into people's privacy. And that issue is visible to all of us. Um, they may have had a couple of other reasons, but, but that was a, uh, certainly a motivating factor. And something that's very not difficult. Not the sand dollar. Not the sand dollar. Just in case. Yeah, yeah, not the sand dollar uh, that we know of. But, uh, but yeah. that it, it, makes it, it makes it difficult because you think about what will, happen in the, uh, it, what will happen when that privacy issue actually gets truly attacked. And then the, and the last thing is I think the, the interoperability piece is Absolutely essential. It's one of the standards on which we're focused today. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives in the market on interoperability, and, and we hope to be part of many of those. But we think uh, that's another thing on which regulators agree, which is we, we, there needs to be interoperability or the system simply won't function. Thank you. I've really enjoyed speaking with you all. And just in our, our last few minutes, I'm going to ask you to break out your crystal balls. And, <laughs> and tell me what you think we'll be talking about in the digital asset space in, say, two years. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I'm going to give a boring answer. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I know there's been a lot of focus in this conference on, on DeFi, but I do think we're such at the early stages that we're still going to be having 
a lot of conversations about DeFi in the next couple of years, uh, and, and that's you know exciting. Uh, I, I think it's it's definitely an area um, you know that uh, needs greater analysis and I think you start looking at the promise of what DeFi can do um, and as you start thinking about Web3 and the decentralization of all of that is just a, a fascinating uh, topic that I think we're still going to be talking about in great detail and, and we were not to, hopefully this is not your answer and I'm not stealing it, but also the, the concept of, of, of uh, identification in, in, in digital ID, I think that's a topic that um, again is so crucial to, to exchanging value and payments and transactions and, and, and all of that that I do think those are, are, are ones that are going to be top of mind going forward. Yeah, yeah I would say um, you, you might have thought you were stealing his I'm answer stealing but mine, yeah. Um, I think that you know, particularly because I come at this from as a former prosecutor and looking at AML and compliance, I think digital identity, that solution is going to unlock so much in this industry, whether it's payments, DeFi, really it's, it's Web3. Like if we want to own things and control things ourselves more, we need to have that solution. So I'm really excited that um, Center is leading the charge on one uh, very promising project. Um, but I think the other thing that I'm very hopeful that in two years we're talking about is actual use cases that are reaching real people who have struggled to build credit, to save, to transact, to send remittances, and that there are more and more real use cases. We, we have real use cases that we see building and, and developing on the Stellar Network, but we're often called to, to speak on the use cases because there, there aren't that many out there. And so that is my hope, and um, that, that that's what we'll all be talking about, not about ransomware or <laughs> meltdowns or um, trading or speculation, but using this technology to help, in, in our case, the, the people who've been excluded from the financial system, but it, it could be any other solution. Um, I'm going to stay with that hope because I think you know, we, the, the cryptocurrency ecosystem has spoken extensively for many for as long as it's been around, about this enabling people to have access to their finances in a different way uh, than they had before. But the promise of that certainly hasn't been realized. And so I would, I would put that in the category of hope of where we can be. Two things I, I, I would predict, and one of them's, I think, fairly straightforward for us, and that is there will be a greater proliferation of stable coins, non-dollar stable coins, that will be interoperable two years from now, and we'll start to separate the stablecoin ecosystem from the other part of the crypto ecosystem because it will lead to more uptake from traditional finance and from other traditional applications. So I think in two years, I'd like to think that if we've done our jobs properly, that that, that will be the case. And the other associated one will be that certain tokens uh, will start to decouple themselves from the risk asset moniker that they have received. We all believe that, that widely used tokens were perhaps a hedge from inflation, a store of value, any number of other things. Uh, and we, that has proven in the recent past that when everything's correlated, everything is correlated. And, and I fully anticipate that we'll start to see a differentiation between those. The utilitarian nature of using tokens for real purposes and accelerating growth in those tokens that is completely disassociated with the macroeconomic environment. Well, that's great. Let's, let's end on that positive note then. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciated all of your, your thoughtful remarks. And let's have a hand for the panel. Thank you all. Thank you very much.